Good morning. Uh, welcome to day two, panel three of the conference, the conflict in Yemen, current situation and future prospects. My name is Ahmad Harb. I am the Director of Research and Analysis at Arab Center, Washington, DC. It is my pleasure today to moderate this panel entitled, Reactivating the Peace Process, Lessons Learned and Pathways Forward. Since 2011, Yemen has gone through serious developments that threatened its existence as a unified state. The Yemeni version of the Arab Spring that erupted in Sana'a and other uh, Yemeni cities demanding political, economic, and social change has unfortunately failed to collapse the old ways of politics in a country that represents an essential ring in the security of the Arabian Peninsula, the Red Sea, and the Horn of Africa. But before representing a challenge and threat to regional security, the Yemen conflict is first and foremost a threat to some 30 million Yemenis who have endured wars, divisions, humanitarian crises, outside intervention, and decades of authoritarian rule. To speak of a peace process in Yemen that is supposed to help the country cross to a peaceful existence is to discuss many failed attempts at peace peacemaking. So far, and as is obvious from the calamitous daily news emerging from Yemen, no process has come to fruition. Indeed, what had been the case is a continuous and seemingly unending series of ceasefires, provisional agreements, and broken promises. Instead, a number of Arab and United Nations sponsored deals and rounds of negotiations have only proven fruitless because they fell victim to piecemeal proposals that worked for a short period of time or simply failed because of the lack of buy-in by important and central actors. While the GCC initiative in 2011-2012 was only for the purpose of charting a course for a peaceful transition of power to a democratic policy, it nonetheless contained some items that could have helped Yemen find its civic peace. In fact, the national dialogue it set in motion was supposed to be a conduit to that peace, where all segments of Yemeni society had the opportunity to participate and propose ideas for a more inclusive political process. That that national dialogue failed to arrive at the desired outcome was a failure for, for which many in Yemen and the international community bear the responsibility. To be sure, the collapse of that dialogue on the altar of competing proposals and, and uh, visions precipitated uh, the current conditions today's conference is trying to address. From the mission of Jamal bin Omar to that of Ismail Wilshed Ahmed to that of Martin Griffiths and the current one of Hans Grunberg, it has become clear that there will be no peace in Yemen if the Yemenis themselves do not seek it and work for it. Today, the United States has its own uh, uh, Yemen envoy, Mr. Timothy Lender King, who, has, uh, who also has been on the road to find ways of uh, arriving at that elusive peace. At, uh, as Mr. Leonard King stated in his address to this conference yesterday, and as many others around Yemen, the region and the world know, there can be no military solution to the conflict in Yemen. A process of diplomacy and diplomatic initiative must be initiated for there to be peace in the country. All parties must compromise because they should have no illusion that military means will lead to a peaceful country. This is what we will try to address in this panel. We have a capable group of experts who will today speak to the issue of peace and the ways to arrive at it. They will be speaking in the order in which I will introduce them. Asmahan Al-Alas is a professor of history at Aden University, and she will be discussing Yemen's path to peace between the consequences of war and future challenges. Ahmed Shami is the executive director of the Arabian Rights Watch Association, and he will be uh, talking about Saudi-Yemeni relations, nature, consequences, and lessons learned to revive the peace process. Alexander Shubridge is peace process support coordinator at Elusive Peace, and he will be participating in place of Tanya Papenholz, uh, who cannot join us today, and he will be discussing pathways to perpetual peace building in Yemen. 
We unfortunately will not be joined by Stacy Philbrick Yadav because she has a family emergency she needs to attend to, but she sends her regards to the conference organizers and the audience. Instead, however, we will have Mr. Rafat uh, Al Akhali, uh, who is the co founder of Deep Group Cons uh, Consulting, one of the uh, organizers of this conference, uh, who will present a paper titled Building the Capacity of Public Leaders in Times of War The Case of Hikma Fellowship, a paper that has been co authored by Sultan Barakat. Uh, 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 Asmahan, the floor is yours. Microphone, please. Microphone. Thank you all very much for organizing this conference. My paper is, the title of my paper is Yemen's Path to Peace Between the Consequences of War and Future Challenges. This paper aims... No, no, we can hear you, but it seems like there's a problem with the sound with Ahmad. But we can hear you. Please go ahead. This paper is on introduces the, the ge geographic and strategic dimensions of the location of Yemen and the history of international conflicts over the site and also the, the impact of the war on the situation in Yemen and the results the results from this situation on any potential solutions in the future. One of, the, one of the characteristics of the site of Yemen is that it overlooks the Bab al Mandab Strait and the northern northern passages through Bab, the Bab al Mandab Strait, as well as the islands uh, in the strait and in that area. Throughout history, this this area, this location, has been the site of regional international conflicts through different dimensions uh, throughout ancient history and, and until modern history, until the United Kingdom ended its conflict with France over this site. When France, when France tried to control areas near the Red Sea uh, towards the Indian Ocean and the United Kingdom invaded the island of Mayun in, in 1799. And after, in 1802, it signed the first commercial agreement with the ruler of Aden at the time, who was Sultan al Abdali at the time. And in 1839, it had invaded the city of Aden, which Became, came under the rule of the British crown and the island of Mayun became part and parcel of this city. During British rule of Aden, Britain administered the islands under its administration in Aden, including the island of Mayun specifically. It, it administered them in, in ways that were in manner in ways that were different than its administration of the city of Aden, and it man administered them outside of the scope of the administration of the city of Aden. In modern history, the value of, of Babel Menda of the Babel Mendab Strait and the island of Mayun were important in a number of different events. When, when Aden's independence uh, became close and Israel was afraid that Israeli trade would not be allowed through the strait, the United Kingdom announced to, or, or proposed to the United Nations that the United Nations take control of the island of Mayun. Suqatra in the Arabian Sea added to the value of the strait and also added to the value of the island of Mayun because the because the island of Sokotra is linked to both Asia and Africa 
In 1973, the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen closed the Bab al-Mandeb Strait against for the countries who were supporting the October war between Israel and the Arab states. This is this demonstrates the value of this area and the, the importance of this island, which is going to be the topic of many of the discussions that we hear about the war in Yemen. The second part of this paper focuses on the trajectory of the civil war in Yemen between 2015 to 2021. In 2014 and 2015, fights, uh, clashes started in uh, Ta'iz, Rada' and Amran after Ansar Allah took control of Sana'a. Of Sana On the 25th of March, the Houthis advanced towards Lahj, Dala', Shabwa, and Adan towards the areas that were still under the control of the legitimate government, which fled from Sana'a to Adan. Adan International Airport was a site of many of these clashes as were other parts of the city of Aden, which were targeted by the Houthi war. But the history on 22nd of July 2015, the city of Aden was liberated by the efforts of its residents, after which the government announced that it launched Operation Golden Arrow, supported by the forces of the Arab coalition to liberate the rest of the cities in the south. The clashes, on the other hand, remained in areas far from Adan, in Ta'iz, in Marib, and in Bayda. And there were also clashes in Ib at the time, and all of these clashes and all of these battles continued and had an impact on the situation on the ground. Uh, and this impact cannot be ignored when discussing future possibilities. The first of these impacts was that there was a new map of military control, which had administrative, political, ideological, and administrative impact throughout Yemen. This new map that was imposed by the conflict is expected to be a criteria for, or one of the conditions that impacts the political process in the future. It will also have a role in in creating the, polit the political map of Yemen in the future. This map will play a role in the agenda of the political process in the future. The government's control of the Bab al Mandab Strait and the Dubab Strait, as well as the Mocha, or the port of Mocha, as well as is has increased its control of many of the southern areas. In October 2015, the government took control of Sarwah and Marib. In the middle of October 2015, the government regained control of Lahj, Abyan, Dala, Shabwa, and Marib, and the, and the fighting continued intermittently in Ta'iz, Bayda, Al Jauf, Ib, and Hudayda, while Sana'a, the Mar, Mahwait, and Amran remained under the authority of Ansar Allah. At the end of 2015, the military took control of the islands of Zuqur and Hunaysh and took full control of the mass military base. And, and government forces went into Hajja and the governorate of Sana'a through the Atwal land crossing and continued advancing towards that. On the other side, the Al-Qaeda became more active in the liberated areas in the south in Abyan, uh, Shabwa, and Adan. This reality and its impact, this division of, the, of Yemen led to the following impacts. First, there was clear fragmentation and divisions in the administrative map in Yemen, which hindered the ability of the government and its institutions to function properly. These areas of divisions in the north continued to be a threat, continued to be a threat in the, to the government and its institutions in Marib. And there was a clear attempt by Ansar Allah to have a, or a clear vision from Ansar Allah to have a division of power, considering that they are de facto authorities on the ground. After the war in 2015, Yemen has been divided into different military and political cantons with different authorities. Ansar Allah control the Northern Highlands. The government controls Marib and Ta'iz. 
what, what were well Taiz is divided between the legitimate government and other forces. The STC took control of Adan and the surrounding areas. The joint forces took control on the west coast. And Mayur and Sokotra were also under the control of the joint forces with the presence of the STC. The, the, the Hadramaut coast was under the control of the local authorities. And all of these different areas are managed based on the political, ideological, and military agendas that are not national in nature. There were areas that have started to emerge recently, and this shows uh, this was done through a tribal government uh, alliance supported by Saudi Arabia. The government controls parts of Taiz. Al Qaeda spreads throughout areas in Al Bayda, Shabwa, and Hadramaut. And there were also other results of these divisions, and these divisions can be summarized as, follow, as follows. These, these divisions and th their impact will hinder the the international efforts uh, to restore the Yemeni state. And this will be invested by foreign interventions to ensure weakening of the national identity. The lack of, of a clear military strategy by the coalition and the government immediately after, after their victories in the southern areas and the, uh, will hinder the re re regaining control of the capital and the return of the government to it. The government and the Arab coalition did not take did not document the areas that they had that they had damaged or destroyed during the military operations, and they did not have clear plans for protection and mapping for important cultural sites in accordance with international humanitarian law. The forces of the coalition did not provide did not ensure that there would be national military capacity to participate in these operations to support and secure the areas that were liberated, specifically the southern areas. And the coalition did not try to strengthen the legitimate authorities and ensure that they had formal uh, presence in Aden, the, not securing coasts and islands and ports with them being under the control of informal authorities, with them remaining even until today under informal authorities like the island of Sokotra, like the island of Mayun and later on the parts of the west coast are also under the control of informal or non-state groups based on the withdrawal and redeployment decision that was made on january 19th 2019 not not taking control of these seaports as a part of a strategy to restore the state and to stabilize its legitimacy and the fact that Mayu, the island of Mayun fell to or it was taken under, under the control of Emirati forces, while Sokotra was taken under the control of the STC with Emirati presence and support in general from the UAE. The withdrawal of the joint forces from the West Coast without coordinating with the formal and legitimate authorities or even with the United Nations. If you could please go to the next slide. I've already read this slide. I think it's the next one. The war has created a new map of Yemen based on the military control of the two sides of the conflict and their divisions. Why did you go to the next slide? These divisions on the ground by the two sides of the conflict have led to very clear fragmentation on the map of on the map of Yemen, and they have hindered the sustainability of the state and of state institutions. Ansarullah took control of the north. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I think I've already read this. Saitara 
السيطرة أن صار الله على صار الله took control of the northwestern areas and they started to threaten the sites sites of the gover- government sites in the north and they took further control of the authorities in Sana'a and they aim to implement an, or reach an agreement that, imp- that imposes this reality. Uh, Dr. Asmahan, if I may intervene here a little bit. Uh, uh, could you please, uh, we have probably about three more minutes. Can you uh, speed it up breathe. a little bit if you can possibly? Thank you. I will breathe. Uh, since uh, hatta fi 19 November 2019 kana qarar al On the 19th of November 2019, the joint forces uh, in the West Coast decided uh, to leave the West Coast under the pretext of the relocation to the South. But the reality indicates uh, otherwise. This direction they have withdrawn or retreated uh, towards cities uh, in the Hodeida governorate. But in reality, they have uh, relocated themselves uh, into some parts of Taiz to control the land movement or mobility towards Taiz and Ib. And this is uh, the first time for the joint forces uh, to be deployed there to these mountainous and landlocked areas. And at the same time, this relocation of the joint forces was analyzed uh, by different uh, political parties or different political parties understood it uh, as uh, a movement to close uh, Taiz uh, from the seaside and uh, an, a movement towards fighting the Islah party in Taiz. And uh, the joint forces went in a different direction away from the Hudayda governorate. The other factor that can have an impact, uh, significant impact on the prospects of peace uh, in Yemen is the Silk Road that will uh, absolutely pass through the Yemeni cities. And uh, this uh, very important uh, sea uh, shipping route, but the situation requires a clear coalition and alliance in these areas. Biden stated that he will leave the Middle East and will head towards the South China Sea to be closer to the Russians and the Chinese. But the Chinese project, which is the Silk Road, the Road and the Belt Initiative focuses on the alliances with the US and the close friends of the United States, those who are close to the Yemeni reality and those who will support the securing of the administrative and management issues of this road. There are two concerns here. These international movements, uh, all of them, the uh, some of them, the relocation of the joint forces uh, from parts of the West Coast and uh, their relocation to the governorate of Shabwa is an evidence that this is not relocation, it is redeployment. And at the same time, they have allowed Ansarallah forces to be present near the Red Sea. Thank you for your interest and attention and I'm very happy to receive any questions. Thank you. Ahmed Shami, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all, Ahmed Shami. I'd like to thank the Arab Center, Washington, D.C., and the conflict and the Center for Conflict and the Humanitarian Studies in Deep Root for this uh, conference. And we hope that uh, the uh, conference can produce knowledge 
and insights. Uh, in my paper, I'll be discussing the nature of the relationships or the way Saudi Arabia is dealing with Yemen currently throughout history. And we'll try to have lessons learned from some of the past experiences. If uh, these uh, things are uh, understood, uh, probably they can draw a roadmap for peace uh, and uh, can remove some of the concerns uh, and the issues. We start with the statement that since the creation of Saudi Arabia, by nature, it is an expansionist state and uh, it uh, has borders with different countries in the Gulf region, in addition to the north and south of the Arabian Peninsula. Saudi Arabia remained in a vacuum after the Ottoman Empire was uh, trying to have access uh, to different resources, especially after the departure of Britain from the south and part of Yemen. At that time, and before that, there were some understandings concerning that vacuum in a Suleimani Mukhlaf after the departure of al Idrisi and the race uh, between uh, King Abdul Aziz and uh, Imam Yahya to control and to grab uh, lands uh, that uh, were controlled by others, including Asir, Najran, and Jizan. So they have uh, produced uh, a sound agreement uh, when the features of this agreement are still in implementation until today. The Saudi position throughout uh, times and history concerning Yemen is uh, clear. Yemen is the strategic depth of Saudi Arabia in terms of security, economy, and geopolitics. And it is not a secret that the population of Yemen is, uh, is more than the population of Yemen is more than all the population of all GCC countries. And therefore, Yemen is always views, viewed as a threat and that uh, this population block uh, is a source of concern. But the way Saudi Arabia dealt with these concerns was always, Saudi Arabia always wanted uh, to have unofficial relations. Uh, Saudi Arabia avoided the official or the formal relations with Yemen. It was in the interest of Saudi Arabia in the past to deal with uh, personalities, figures, tribes of different sorts in the country. And this was highlighted after the end of the war between the monarchists and the Republicans in Yemen in the 60s. After that, Saudi Arabia created the uh, so-called the Special Committee and the special committee represented a ministry for the affairs of Yemen. And the special committee was attending the Council of Ministers meetings in Saudi Arabia. And the Yemeni file had a special nature for Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia dealt with Yemen uniquely. Saudi Arabia tried uh, in the past to create a kind of a balance in Yemen. And this balance or these balances would enable Saudi Arabia to be the controller and the administrator of Yemen, its affairs uh, and the uh, different interactions inside Yemen. And therefore, Saudi Arabia all the time uh, was uh, concerned of uh, any decisions inside Yemen that uh, might revoke the agreements between Yemen and Saudi Arabia or that might revive the discussion about the borders between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabia had an expansionist uh, approach uh, towards the southern part of Yemen as well, and it annexed Sharura and al wadia which are parts of Yemen. These are uh, territories of the southern Yemen. Anyway, after that, Saudi Arabia started to strengthen its relations with the tribal sides and the security and military people more than developing its former relations with the Yemeni government as a government. And this practice continued until we have the reunification of Yemen in 1990. And at that time, maybe Yemen 
started uh, to have some strong positions that annoyed uh, Saudi Arabia and that were concerning to Saudi Arabia, including, for example, the position of Yemen concerning the Gulf War and the invasion of uh, Iraq to Kuwait. And what happened during the civil war in Yemen in 1994 and the Saudi position, which was uh, always trying to control what is happening in the country, not through the formal relations with the government, but through the informal relations with individuals in Yemen. Saudi Arabia continued this approach after the war of 94, and these individuals or figures uh, changed uh, the relationships between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And we have reached in 98, the uh, agreement on the borders between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. But this Saudi policy changed actually during the era or reign of uh, King Abdullah. King Abdullah in 2005 ascended to the uh, throne, but before that he was the crown prince and he was dealing with the Yemeni file and he had a different view about the Yemeni file. King Abdullah was seeing that Yemen should be a stable state, secure state in order for Saudi Arabia to be secure and to avoid having Saudi Arabia all the time uh, mean uh, tired with the Yemeni file uh, or engaged in the Yemeni file directly through different figures and through the government and through the tribal uh, sheikhs. Uh, so he wanted, uh, King Abdullah then started discussing the accession of Yemen to the GCC Council. And the purpose of that was to keep Yemen under a certain level of control or discipline in order to have Yemen having the necessary qualifications in order to join the GCC Council. And on the other hand, former President Ali Abdullah Saleh was controlling the direct relations with the Saudi Arabia and the special committee was no more effective as it used to be. After the Arab Spring events, Saudi Arabia was, was out of reach uh, sometimes. Saudi Arabia did not grasp or understand these quick developments and therefore Saudi Arabia changed its approach uh, and uh, then had the initiative and started to administer the Yemeni file. It took the Yemeni file from the hands of Qatar and proposed the GCC initiative, and it re-established its uh, communications with individuals and people inside Yemen. And because of that, the uh, former uh, modus operandi was reinstated. Um, the way Saudi Arabia dealt with Yemen in the 80s and the 90s was reinstated after the Arab Spring because of the GCC initiative. And from here, during the NDC and uh, with the emergence of the idea of federalism in Yemen, Saudi Arabia thought that uh, these regions or the federalism approach might be aligned with its purposes and aims. Why? Because uh, Saudi Arabia can contain some of the forces within certain geographic regions and can deal with the different regions directly, not with the central government in Yemen. And it was the starting point uh, absolutely to divide and fragment Yemen as the case uh, was in Iraq. Although the uh, federal proposal had some noble objectives, but these uh, concerns uh, maybe uh, were one of the sparks of the Yemeni war. Saudi Arabia at that time, although it uh, supported the peace and accord agreement and uh, after uh, Ansarullah controlled uh, Sana'a in September 2014, Saudi Arabia saw that it was uh, in a very narrow position and window and Saudi Arabia wanted to have other leverages and tools to deal with Yemen because uh, its authority and dominance uh, started to wane and its uh, presence and influence uh, plummeted. So Saudi Arabia wanted 
to regain uh, control uh, and uh, as uh, the the united states and iran reached an agreement concerning the nuclear uh, file and saudi arabia wanted to have more influence in yemen because at that time saudi arabia lost its influence in the entire region uh, we need to examine the situation of saudi arabia or the position of saudi arabia before and after saudi arabia lost its influence in syria lebanon iraq and even even in the GCC region. And uh, then uh, Yemen was, is uh, controlled by Ansarullah, which is uh, uh, and controlled the land borders uh, between Yemen and uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, Saudi Arabia wanted then to uh, have a hand in the decision making process inside Yemen. The foreign policy magazine after the uh, onset of the storm of resolve by Saudi Arabia, foreign policy said that uh, Saudi Arabia initiated a war against Yemen under a pretext that uh, Iran is there in Yemen, but the presence of Iran became a reality in Yemen after the storm of resolve. Uh, actually, there was no visible or invisible Iranian role in Yemen before 2015. Uh, uh, Sarullah Group had coalitions with different political parties, but the role of Iran became more uh, prominent after the storm of resolve because the balance of power in the region changed and Saudi Arabia intervened. And here, I want to conclude some of the points. I try to be brief be, for the sake of time. I conclude here that Saudi Arabia has to change uh, its uh, view and dealing with Yemen. So Yemen should be dealt with, the Yemeni government should be dealt with as a sovereign government, and Yemen should be dealt with as a sovereign state with uh, its uh, territorial integrity and its sovereignty over its land and seas. Uh, Saudi Arabia has to deal with Yemen like any other country, uh, and Saudi Arabia can have some exceptional and great relations with Yemen, especially as both countries are bordering each other. And Saudi Arabia has to open communications of channel with Yemen. And uh, I emphasize her here in the past that there were opportunities to create some kind of understanding between Ansarullah and Saudi Arabia. But sadly, we did not uh, see positive results out of these attempts. Uh, we need to revive these attempts and there should be an agreement or an understanding between Ansarullah as a de facto authority and government and Saudi Arabia in order to resolve and to dissipate all the concerns of Saudi Arabia. And then directly we can move into a Yemeni-Yemeni dialogue where Yemeni parties address their issues and then the Yemen and Yemen then should be dealt with uh, through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Saudi Arabia, not individuals or military or intelligence officers. Even the allies of uh, Saudi Arabia now are in a weird position because there are forces that are aligned with the United Arab Emirates uh, and they are with Saudi Arabia as a form of tactics. Uh, and there are forces that are allied with uh, Qatar and Turkey, but uh, Saudi Arabia wants the whole party. So Saudi Arabia wants the whole thing and does not want to give anything to anyone, even to its allies. Uh, Saudi Arabia wants to be the ultimate uh, decision maker in Yemen. And maybe the political forces in Yemen now are not accepting this mindset. Yemen should be viewed differently and probably uh, opening channels of communication between Ansarullah and Saudi Arabia can address these concerns. And then if Yemenis reach a political solution, Saudi Arabia can deal with the government of Yemen as a sovereign government. Thank you, Ahmed, and my uh, apologies uh, for uh, pronouncing your name, Shamsi. Uh, we know it's uh, Shami.
Great, thanks a lot, Imad. Um, and many thanks to the organizers for inviting inclusive peace, uh, not elusive peace, although in the topic of Yemen, it is certainly elusive. Um, but the organization I come from is Inclusive Peace um, to share our experiences and perspectives in this important uh, meeting. And apologies for the um, children's interruption. Let me just move rooms one second. My sincere apologies for that. Um, that's life in COVID times and working from home and so on. Um, yeah, but Inclusive Peace is a think and do tank which combines comparative research on peace and political transition processes with tailored support to stakeholders involved in peacemaking and peace building efforts. Uh, a number of speakers already today and, and yesterday, of course, have reflected on the heightened conflict dynamics in Yemen and the continuing frustrations related to peacemaking efforts. In this context, it's fairly obvious that there's a fundamental need, but also an opportunity to rethink peacemaking and and peace building efforts in Yemen. As Rafat said yesterday, and Imad, as you also said yourself at the beginning of this session, there have been many failed attempts at peacemaking um, and other initiatives such as the National Dialogue Conference have been have, have failed to be able to deliver on, on their early promise and on their potential. So over the next 10 minutes or so, I'll try to reflect a little bit and take stock of the current peace peacemaking efforts in Yemen. Um, I'll also then explain why we as the peacemaking and the international uh, peace building community need to go beyond the current framing that we're applying to contexts like Yemen, including concepts like tracks and even negotiation processes, and conclude by proposing why understanding and applying the idea of perpetual peace building could provide an alternative approach um, whilst recognizing you know, the incredible complexity and challenges that we're, that we're seeing in a context like Yemen. So the idea of perpetual peace building recognizes that peace building and peace processes cannot be separated from the arc of a society's development. Um, they're not moments in time, they're not snapshots, it's more of a continuum. Uh, in this way, peace processes are better understood as a series of negotiations and renegotiations of the social and political contract in a society. Linear negotiation processes and the typical sequencing of negotiations to agreement to implementation simply do not match the reality. And I think Yemen is, is a classic example of that, where the peace process in some ways is frozen in time back from when the mandate was provided. And of course, as, as um, colleagues, speakers earlier in this session also alluded to, the, the fundamental map of Yemen has changed, has changed um, irreconcilably. You know, over those seven years. So this also implies a radical shift in the roles that mediators and peace builders have, emphasizing more roles as critical friends, demonstrating the limitations of concepts like tracks, peace agreements, and even peace processes. So moving now on, on to what that means and what the current peacemaking efforts in, in Yemen have looked like. And of course, we've heard from colleagues from the Office of the Special Envoy and others that are, that are closer and deeply involved in that process. Um, the efforts made by the UN and other members of the international community to promote peace in Yemen following the escalation of the conflict in 2015 have struggled and stalled. Official high-level negotiations have rarely produced results, and on the few occasions on which agreements have been reached, they haven't been implemented. It's not only in Yemen that international peace building is failing and peacemaking is failing to set societies on pathways to peace. We see the same things in Syria, in Libya, in Sudan, e Ethiopia, and a number of other contexts where peace talks remain locked in conventional linear formats, negotiations have floundered, and any attempts at broadening inclusion are all too frequently shallow and cosmetic. Despite this, the UN, uh, despite their best efforts, of course, and to recognize that, have been constrained by the parameters of the resolution in 2000, the uh, Security Council Resolution 2216, and the fact that the tools available are no longer suited to the tasks at hand. This also has significant downriver consequences as many of the track two efforts in Yemen have been oriented around and sought to influence the track one process. But when that track pro one process fundamentally doesn't work, that creates significant impacts and, and effects. Many of the track two initiatives in Yemen supported by a variety of actors are based on the flawed assumption of connectedness and linkages 
the idea that what can be done in a track two space can be transferred to and influence um, the process, the content, the agenda, the outcomes in a track one space. This assumption, again, does not match reality in Yemen, nor in other parts of the world, um, particularly in instances like in Yemen, where the track one process is essentially frozen or deadlocked or doesn't really exist. Um, most track two initiatives in Yemen are still driven by one theory of change only to influence the UN-led track one process. As this process has stalled, most initiative, most track two initiatives have really struggled to re-articulate a core objective and to think more creatively beyond this path dependency, beyond this very this stuckness in a way, what the possibilities for them could be, but also what the implications and possibilities for their for their peacemaking and peace building efforts in Yemen could also be. So in this way, and when then taking stock and, and considering this idea of perpetual peace building, um, there, there's re really a need to make way for a more homegrown inclusive process. Imad, you mentioned the National Dialogue Conference convened between 2013 and 2014, where whilst it was condemned as unwieldy and unrepresentative and unrealistic, we heard also from Ibrahim yesterday, in some ways, the dialogue did nevertheless succeed in bringing together Yemenis from across the country to, to deliberate the future of the state. Um, of course, it didn't achieve the outcomes that the promise sort of suggested it could. Um, but in terms of inclusiveness, in terms of process design, there are many good things that, that we could learn from that as, as peacemakers as we look at the current situation in Yemen. Um, and I think it's also, there's, there's really a lot of opportunities also to learn from other contexts as well, which have, have experienced um, successive peace negotiation processes, national dialogue processes as well, so that we can take a step up and, and look, look beyond the, the process that sits in front of us and if it's stalled or if it's struggling um, and to see it much more in a continuum. Um, in a recent event that we've done on with national dialogue practitioners from around the world, a colleague from Kenya described the Kenyan experience as a series of national dialogues with each building on the last. And this idea of continuity can prompt us to reflect on lessons from past and current peacemaking efforts in Yemen and elsewhere, but can also spark imagination about what a future series of peacemaking efforts and outcomes could look like in the country. From this perspective, it is also possible to recognize and draw from traditional approaches to dialogue and reconciliation in Yemen, where tribes and others have played a critical role and where local issues have often been connected to national level dialogue. The National Dialogue Conference is just one example of this, though of course it was, it was imperfect as we've heard. And of, over the past six years, there's been a fundamental impact on the social fabric of the country, which has had an impact on the viability of such traditional approaches. But they do still exist, and in many parts of the country, they are functioning on a daily basis. And so in that way, whilst the, at track one, you cannot be too, too optimistic and too hopeful about what the, the immediate prospects are, there are other examples, there are other experiences in the country which do offer an alternate point of departure for reimagining how peace can be advanced in the country. So rather than continuing to knock on doors and calling for a seat at the table, which is barely standing, Yemenis must be afforded the space to rethink the peace process in its entirety. In doing so, they can ask the following questions. What are the flaws of current approaches to peace building and peacemaking in the state? What do the Yemeni people in all their diversity seek? How do they envision their future state? What relationship do they seek with their neighbors in the region? And what pre-existing initiatives exist that can be preserved, developed, fortified, and capitalized upon to deliver on this vision? By expanding the very definition of peace building to encompass locally owned formal and informal processes, peace building in Yemen will inevitably come to encompass greater swaths of society together with a broader range of themes and challenges. While peace building in this conception may also become more messy and prolonged, it will nevertheless represent a leap forward from the deeply frustrating, ineffectual and stubbornly conventional efforts which currently dominate the conflict and peacemaking efforts. Uh, thank you, Alex, uh, Alex for your uh, presentation. Uh, now, uh, Rafat Al-Akhali, please. Shukran, shukran, Sayyid Ahmad. Rafat Al-Akhali. Thank you, Ahmad. I'm Rafat Al-Akhali. 
I'm very pleased uh, to speak after Alex uh, because he provided an excellent uh, introduction to my talk, and I'll try to be brief this paper. It is an attempt to answer the question raised by Alex, how can we envision different tracks or pathways for peace in Yemen other than the tracks that uh, recently have become blocked or obstructed, which is the track sponsored by the United Nations. So this is a question in the minds of many of those who are working in peace building. And in this paper, myself and Sultan Barakat, we try to conduct a quick evaluation. The paper is still a draft, and I will raise some ideas here. We are still uh, evaluating this uh, experience in creating different pathways for peace in Yemen. I will be speaking primarily on the program that we call the new generation of public leaders in Yemen. And we tried to answer the, or the main question of this paper was how can we have real inclusion of youth in the peace process and in political decision making in light of the current conditions in Yemen as a country going through an armed conflict. There are always, we always hear from an in in international level about the importance of the youth agenda and peace and security. There's always talk of inclusivity. And like Alex said, there are, that we can see this in attempts to try to find a seat at the table, a table that isn't there in the first place because the process has stopped. So, uh, stopped. so in light of this, uh, this ongoing situation, how can we, what can we think about with regards to the inclusion of youth? Who exactly are these youth? How can we create new space, create new spaces and new platforms to ensure progress in the in the peace process in an innovative or different way than the current situation? When we thought about this, we looked at we looked at it at three different levels or from three different perspectives. The overall objective was to support what broader inclusion and participation of youth in public leadership and in political decision making. But we looked at this from three different levels and in each, at each level, we found that there was a gap and we tried to work on bridging this gap and to work on interventions that will do that. The first level was the local level. And by the local level, we mean the sub-national level and the different governors throughout Yemen. And at this level, we found that there were there were efforts and there were activities that were not seen especially by international actors or by academics who are studying peace in yemen and we found this in local mediation efforts we found that this scene was very active that there were local mediators who had a who were very qualified and very effective in the work that they did and that and these local mediators were doing things that ma many formal and international mediation efforts had failed to do, but that they were working on very specific issues and in very specific areas and not at the national level. So, for example, the, these local mediators worked on the exchange of uh, prisoners, detainees and bodies. And this is one of the most active fields for local mediators that they have been very successful in every week, every month, every year. There are hundreds of these exchanges between the par various parties to the conflict through these local mediators. So at this level, at the local level, we tried to think about how can we support the participation of youth and their inclusion in these local mediation efforts, which are usually efforts that are limited to a small number of people, either people who have social influence, like tribal leaders, or people who are able to, to build mutual confidence or trust between the party, between themselves and the parties of the conflict. And we've seen that in this field, there is a significant lack of participation of youth because these activities or their participation of youth in peace building is usually limited to, for example, advocacy campaigns, uh, media campaigns and other things, but not in uh, local mediation efforts uh, themselves. So this is what we saw at the local level. And we had the idea to form the youth mediation support team that I will speak about uh, very quickly later. At the, 
national level, we found a different gap. We found that the political elites in Yemen over at least the past three decades have been very centralized, uh, meaning that even the, po the various political parties and the different political ideologies, all of the different political leaders were in one in one way or another have known each other for decades and have been part of the uh, in the same circles and especially after the 1990s they were concentrated mainly in Sana'a and th there were relationships between these various political elites they knew each other they had cut choose together for anyone who knows Yemen and so there were very strong interpersonal relationships between this old guard of the political elites. But after 2014 and the period after it, we saw the emergence of a new group of political elites. When we look at Yemen, there, there is now a different group of political elites from the one that was there before. There are political movements that have emerged in the recent period. Either they emerged or were established, or they have become more influential in the political map. So, for, exa the, for example, this includes the STC, one of the new actors on the scene, as well as the Hadramaut Inclusive Conference, uh, the Ansar Allah movement itself, which is a new actor in the political arena in Yemen and has become one of the primary actors, as well as many other political movements or political actors, uh, if we can call them that. This new group of elites, its, its leaders, have been a mix of youth leaders. And in each one of these movements, they obviously have their own personal, their own characteristics and specific context. But something that is in common is that they have brought to, uh, has, have brought up a new group of leaders and a new group of elites that are now in control of the situation. Th this leadership is different from the old guard of uh, political elites because they, one of the differences is that they do not know each other personally. The leaders of these various movements might not have met someone, uh, an individual or a member or a leader from the other movements that have become influential in Yemen. Unlike the situation before, due to the ongoing conflict, there is there are very sharp divisions between the various regions in Yemen and the leadership and mem members of different political movements are cannot go to other parts of the country for security uh, for security concerns and this has imposed a new reality that those in control of the scene in Yemen do not know each other as well as the old political elites did and sometimes we say that uh, i think not everyone will agree with this but the war has become a war that people are are not fighting each other, but they're fighting what they imagine the other side to be. They don't know each other. They've never had direct dialogues or, or discussions, and they do not have any kind of interpersonal relationships with the leadership from the other side. They're even members of these various political movements. This has become a new reality that is forming in Yemen with new youth leaders who are now in control of the situation and who who require uh, capacity building for, for leadership because they are new to uh, being public leaders, but they also require or, or need the creation of networks with the members and leadership of other political movements. So this was at the national level. And based on this, we launched the HECMA Fellowship for Public Leaders to try to bridge this gap. With regards to the regional level, we found that there was a disconnect between public leaders and youth leaders in Yemen and their peers from the various countries in the Gulf. With these divisions and this disconnect, we have found that there are no platforms or spaces that bring together these youth who are influential in their societies on different issues, whether they are political issues or economic issues or military and security related issues. And so this was another gap that we saw, especially in the situation in Yemen, which has become more and more linked to the situation in the region. And so this was why we worked on creating the forum of youth leaders in Yemen and the Gulf. And these are the three interventions that we designed and worked on to try to produce a different kind or a different approach to peace through these interventions. And this is an experience that is still or, or is still in its, uh, its, its beginning stage 
and we're working on assessing the first round or first stage of these interventions to try to build on them and understand the lessons learned. With regards to the local component, we had interventions specifically in the Taz governorate and the Jof and Madab governorates. We supported the youth mediation support team. This team did not uh, get training uh, in mediation, but they worked to support the local mediators that I mentioned earlier, who are actually working on the ground to mediate and ha hold direct negotiations uh, with the political and military decision makers in, on the various on the sides of the conflict. This program, the Youth Mediation Support Team, helped the youth to be a part of these me mediation efforts and to help the to support the local mediators, whether in documenting their efforts and providing analysis and in trying to reach different solutions, whether through databases, for example, of the prisoners and detainees who were exchanged, databases for missing persons, things that the local mediators had been lacking and were trying to find support in. They also helped them arrange meetings and communication with civil society organizations, for, uh, for example, as well as with international organizations. These were all things that the youth brought to the table and helped the uh, support the mediators and they were able to be a part of these mediation efforts. They were part of the meetings with the parties and they worked, for example, on the prisoner and detainees exchanges. I wanted to share some of the pictures of these efforts for a number of prisoners who were uh, exchanged as well as some of the bodies that were recovered and exchanged. Uh, these individuals, for example, who were working on recovering and exchanging bodies did not have even the bare minimum of uh, personal protective equipment or the supplies that they would need to recover the bodies and to transport them. And the youth were able to mobilize funding to, to and provide them with the support that they needed. Also in the prisoner exchanges, this is one of the exchange uh, initiatives that the youth supported the mediators, uh, leading to the release of more than 200 individuals in the Taz governorate, 200 detainees and prisoners. These are some of the ways that the youth were able to participate effectively. In 2021, there was a total of 663 prisoners and bodies that were exchanged between Ansar Allah and the government of Yemen. The youth mediation support team documented these efforts and supported them and, and took part in the exchange processes themselves. And this is a very quick example of the work that they are doing. Uh, uh, if we compare these with the formal peace efforts and initiatives in 2021, there was just a single meeting that was held in February of 2021 between the government of Yemen and Ansar Allah. It continued for around three weeks and did not result or did not lead to any agreement for the exchange of prisoners. So this is a comparison of the work on the ground in the local mediation and the work and efforts in the formal peace process. And this is why there is a need to look for new tracks. With regards to the national component, the Hekma Fellowship brought together 15 uh, first level or first tier leadership leaders in the various political parties. And we and, uh, started with uh, capacity building and leadership from a number of experts and important international institutions in very specific uh, issues, whether in negotiating in adaptive leadership and in public policy analysis, as well as in transition management. These were all very important skills and abilities that these, uh, these youth leaders needed to have in the work that they do and in their role as public leaders. There were also a number of talks that they heard uh, from Lakhdar Brahimi, the former president uh, Juan Santos, Prince Hassan bin Talal, a number of individuals who helped share their experiences and held discussions with the, this, uh, the members of the Hikma Fellowship. This program also launched the Hikma Opinion Survey Platform, which attempted to get in touch directly with the popular support bases. I don't want to take too long, so I'll end the presentation here. We can talk more during the question and answer session on the lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafat, and I apologize for uh, interrupting you, but we have a lot of questions. I have many questions. I will try to 
ask as many of them as possible. Uh, uh, I have I have a question from uh, uh, Dr. Abdul Wahab Al-Qassar to Dr. Asmahan. Uh, uh, he asks, uh, uh, do you think that uh, the uh, 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 conflict of interest, so to speak, between two of the mo most important uh, uh, coalition partners, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, the purposes, their purposes, uh, if there is a conflict of interest, do you think that is affecting how this uh, uh, conflict in Yemen is uh, is uh, developing? Uh, please, Dr. Asmahan, if you can uh, just uh, limit your uh, uh, answer to about uh, a minute, a minute and a half. Thank you. So, Rasmahan, mute. Still muted. Uh, Thank you for the question. I, I presented the interests, the regional interests, with regards to the situation in Yemen, or specifically the war in Yemen, and I did not discuss or did not address the different interests or objectives of uh, between Riyadh and Abu Dhabi. The the dispute or the disagreements here are more regional uh, in nature, are more international in nature, and they are being implemented by specific actors or, or proxy agents in Yemen. But the, the, on, the ongoing conflict between them as two states is a completely separate topic and has nothing to do with my paper. But with regards to the d disputes or disagreements that they have in the context of Yemen, they have converging opinions. And I mentioned specifically uh, the, the issue of the Silk Road initiative, that despite the fact that Biden said that that the issue, that, that, the, that these axes, axes have ended, but the coming period will see the, will witness the establishment of new axes in the region with Kuwait, with Saudi Arabia, with Abu Dhabi, with all of these major actors in the region uh, converging in their opinions in this regard. Uh, and so in general, this there is a convergence of these international points of view or interests. Thank you, Dr. Asmahan, for your brevity. Uh, uh, this question is for uh, Mr. Ahmed Shami. Uh, uh, how do you how do you evaluate the uh, the Saudi role uh, that supports the uh, the legitimate uh, uh, government of uh, Dr. Mansour Hadi of uh, President Mansour Hadi uh, uh, as opposed to uh, what the uh, uh, Ansar Allah are doing uh, and uh, their, their new uh, uh, government, uh, what is called Hukumat Linta, Salvation Government. I think there seems to be a problem with Ahmed's connection because he doesn't seem to be online with us. It might have been disconnected. Um, uh, I have I have a question for uh, for Mister uh, for uh, Alex Alex Brobridge. Uh, uh, you, you know, it, it seems that uh, what 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 you said were, were actually quite quite good points about. Uh, negotiations, but do you think, uh, or uh, peace building, uh, do you think that uh, that really still applies to uh, in the Yemeni case? I mean, uh, uh, have things uh, developed uh, way beyond uh, what you are uh, proposing here? Yeah, I mean, I can see why they may appear far-fetched or challenging, but I think that as also um, the colleague uh, from the Special Envoy's Office this morning said that these are really it's they're significant they're hard issues to address but they need to be addressed i think to to speak directly to your question um, i would say it's more foreseeable to imagine um building some level of peace and social cohesion from the bottom up from community level as also rafat spoke about than to imagine a a comprehensive peace agreement that can solve, uh, that can bring all the parties together in, in the country and can solve all the issues on the table. So I think it, starting from the bottom up um, can be more realistic potentially than the current than the current orthodoxy, I would say. Uh, I, I, I have a question here from uh, Matt Bernstein. 
uh, I guess uh, he's asking it uh, of uh, any person uh, on the panel. Uh, what role does the private sector have in these new paths to peace? Uh, how heavy should its influence be or not be? Anybody can take that. If I could present a quick point and then maybe we'll uh, hear from the other parts of speakers. But up until now, the private sector in Yemen has played an important and large role in supporting stability in the country. But this, uh, this role obviously is based both on the humanitarian and uh, economic uh, perspectives or aspects. The continued flow of uh, food, for example, to, to Yemen is something that the private sector has worked on despite all of the difficulties despite the challenges that it faced with road closures, with problems in ports, with problems in uh, reaching contracts, despite all of these problems, the private sector continues to work on importing basic necessities and distributing them throughout Yemen, these basic humanitarian necessities. So this is one, this is the approach, but another approach is, could there be a direct role for the private sector in peace building or in the peace process in general? As of now, this has not been possible because the peace process has not included an economic track, despite the fact that the economic track, as we have heard from some of the presentations before, is one of the most important tracks, especially when it comes to the currency, the banking sector, and the various aspects of the economy. This track was uh, was not was not worked on, and it, it continues to be so. But we have heard from Ain Shireem and the new UN Special Envoy that this track will be included. If this track is included in the peace process, it will allow the private sector to play a larger role in the peace process and for them to have more of an effective and influential role in it. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm going to ask this question of, uh, of Alex. Uh, 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 this is question is from Sousan Rifai. Uh, when the negotiation table is not there, why do we invest resources to add shares into an empty room? How can grassroots groups be mobilized to pressure conflict actors at their own level and using local contextual tools for pressure to at least alleviate conflict impact locally? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. It's the same sorts of questions we've asked ourselves and, in, and our counterparts when we're undertaking research and, and action research and so on in different parts of Yemen, because you do see that the majority of track two initiatives and coalitions, civil society coalitions that orient themselves around peacemaking efforts in Yemen are geared towards influencing um, the office of the special envoy and trying to, to convince that that office to bring certain things to the agenda or um, to bring certain actors to the table to make it more inclusive and so on. And there actually has been much less attention. Also, if you look at comparative um, peace processes in Yemen, there's been much less attention on civil society actually trying to influence the conflict parties, um, which, which the questioner speaks to. So I think those types of efforts are actually sorely needed, um, but it, it does require uh, those civil society actors to move out of the types of path dependency and types of relationships that they have both with different parts of the UN, but also different parts of the international community and amongst themselves as well. I think you're on mute, Emma. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, this uh, this question is um, I'm going to direct it to uh, Dr. Asmahan. Uh, it is here in Intilaq al Mutawakkil. Attafiq wal kathir fi Yemen fi ahmiyat al ibda wal ibtikaa. I and many other people in Yemen agree on the importance of having innovative ways for the peace process and not using the traditional approaches of the United Nations. That we can use local actors and local media uh, approaches to to do, to deal with or to help in peace building. But how can this be done? How can these traditional and Yemeni specific approaches be used when this is more of a regional international uh, conflict at this point? Dr. Asmahan. Thank you. Thank you, Intalaq, for the question. The war truly has become, uh, has taken on more of a regional dimension as I tried to uh, address or show in my presentation. Even the national forces or political groups are working in accordance with foreign 
agendas and even the way that the, the, the map in Yemen is divided seems to be based on these divisions uh, with divisions between the different regional actors based on their specific agendas and ideologies. With the absence of a state, with the absence of a clear national vision of the government to include the achievements of 2015 and ensuring that these uh, victories and, and regaining these areas are stabilized, then we will lose everything that we have been able to achieve. And I've presented this in paper that everything that we were able to achieve in 2015, we have we will continue to uh, lose. And in 2021 we are, or 2022, we're continuing to give concessions to groups that do not or are not related to the uh, national identity of Yemen. Thank you for the question. Uh, shukran, Dr. Asmahan. Uh, I, uh, Thank you, I Dr. Asmahan. I have a question for uh, uh, for uh, Rafat uh, 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 from uh, Intelop also. Uh, the Hikma Fellowship has important and practical dimensions. Uh, as as a youth, Rafat, what is the possibility of of trying to consult youth about the future of Yemen because because it is their future and the and the future of coming Yemeni generations, how included can be. Thank you, Dr. Intalak. I think it's a difficult, this is a difficult question, does not have an easy answer. But I believe that the approach that we try to work on or work through, uh, it, it would be difficult to imagine. It's, it's not impossible, but it's difficult to imagine a completely new reality or a solution that would, that would come from outside of the major political actors. And so despite all of the shortcomings and all of the criticisms and, 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 the, and the weaknesses that we can with we can criticize the political parties in Yemen, but they remain the, the main actors to any future solution or settlement in Yemen. And so I think that the solution at the end of the day needs to bring together both benefiting from the various youth leaders and these political movements, uh, those who can still reach uh, or reach a convergence of views and are not as burdened by the past as the older political elites. But in addition to working with a broader segment of Yemeni society and many people, who, uh, we've heard many times that the political parties in Yemen do not represent the majority of the Yemeni people and that they, they might have their popular support bases, but that there are many Yemenis who are not affiliated with any political parties. But at the end of the day, these people are not as organized and they're not obviously armed. And so they do not have, they do not have a seat at the table uh, negotiating a solution. And so mixing the, having a mix of the two, of working both with the youth uh, leaders in these political movements while at the same time giving an opportunity and creating the space and a platform for influential actors within the youth in Yemen so that they can try to create or mobilize a movement within among the pop, uh, the grassroots to ensure that their voices are conveyed in a solution. So there needs to be a balance between the two. Uh, but, uh, uh, Thank you, Rafat. Much. Uh, I have uh, many other questions. I'm sorry, there is uh, no time to ask them, uh, but uh, we appreciate all uh, your uh, contributions, all the questions you sent in. Uh, we appreciate the uh, panelists' uh, contributions today and their lectures, uh, very uh, uh, good and uh, wide uh, array of uh, ideas and uh, things uh, uh, to think about uh, regarding uh, peace in Yemen. Uh, we uh, thank you for uh, thank you to the audience for uh, staying with us and uh, for sending your questions. Uh, we hope that uh, we can see you in uh, other activities. Um, uh, we now have a ten minute break uh, after which we have uh, uh, panel four uh, that is moderated by uh, Dr. Sultan Barakat and it is uh, on the future of Yemen recovery, reconstruction, and development. Have a